Uh-huh. All right, it's happening. One moment. Okay, Bye. What's up, y'all? Um, glad everybody's back. I'm glad to see everybody who's watching live right now with us um, or who will see it in the future. My name is Rashad, and I am a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. I'm out here in um, occupied Ute territory or so called Denver, Colorado. And uh, yeah, you guys are joining us for the film series. Uh, that's my comrade. Um, you can introduce yourself, comrade. <laughs> Yes, thanks Rashad. Monika, I'm also part of the All African People's uh, Revolutionary Party. I'm here in Tiwa Territory, that's so-called Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so glad you all joined us for the film series that we show every second Saturday of the month, um, starting at 2 p.m. We've been doing this for about four years, I think, and went on uh, online doing it um, during the pandemic. That way we can keep everyone safe and still can do being in community together and showing films that are typically not shown, but really with an emphasis on our people. Uh, yeah, turning it back over to you, Rashad. Yeah, so um, the All African Peoples, just before we get into the, the series, I know some of you guys know who might be in the chat and stuff like that right now, but um, uh, the All African Peoples Revolutionary Party is a revolutionary socialist political party um, based in Africa. Um, our objective and our political goal is Pan-Africanism. And Pan-Africanism is properly defined as the total liberation and unification of Africa under scientific socialism. And so that's what we're going for. That's our, um, that's our goal, that's our plan. That's what we're working towards every day. And that's what the film series and you know our weekly Pan-African news and the other shows our comrades have, um, our ancestors' voices, um, the Pansula podcast uh, for the Kaji Circle. Uh, that's part of you know our uh, the work that we're doing to try and help um, raise the consciousness raise the consciousness of our people, continuing political education, and you know learn things that you know we are we aren't always exposed to. And so yeah, today we're watching a documentary about Samora Michelle, really about um, the Mozambique Revolution and how um, after independence they handled um, uh, things that they had to handle and. Um, Free Limo and the teachings of Free Limo. And so, yeah, it's about a 50 minute documentary. And so after we watch that, we'll come back here and we'll discuss it um, with the chat and everything and with each other. And so, yeah, so we'll get that started right now. Continua. 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 1982, the socialist government of Mozambique, a young independent country in southern Africa, organized a meeting of great political importance. President Samora Michel and his government leaders held a week-long session with some thousand collaborators who had worked by order of Portugal at the time of its colonial domination of Mozambique. People who betrayed their compatriots, sometimes even tortured or killed them. More than a hundred thousand people collaborated with the Portuguese. They are known as the Compromised. They voluntarily joined the fascist party ANP, or became agents of the secret police PIDA, or soldiers in the colonial army, specially trained commandos who attacked villages suspected of supporting Frei Limo. This meeting is part of the final rehabilitation of people who, as President Michel said, would have gone before a firing squad in other revolutions. 
In Mozambique, they were left in their homes and jobs. However, they lost their civil rights, and their pictures and biographies were hung up in their workplaces. After a period of such confrontation with their pasts, the ex-collaborators were considered to be fit for integration as compatriots into the new Mozambican society. And this would seem to be the final stage. Even those who collaborated with colonialism deserve a home country, says the banner hanging above the government leaders. The president stresses that the meeting is an attempt to come to terms with history. It is going to be a tiring, emotional marathon session. By constantly probing each individual, he unravels the stories of how they had come to support the Portuguese against Frei Limo and what their personal role had been. For five centuries, Mozambique has been under the yoke of Portuguese power. In the 50s, factions arise wanting to bring about political and social reforms. But the secret police, PIDA, know how to prevent this. In 1960, more than 600 Mozambicans are killed during a peaceful protest demonstration. As a consequence, the different resistance movements close ranks to form one liberation movement, Frei Limo. Some years later, the freedom fighters march from the neighboring country of Tanzania into the north of Mozambique and begin an armed struggle. At the same time, they try to mobilize the population to support them. With brute force, the Portuguese rulers try to stop the Liberation Front. But the Frei Limo soldiers conquer the northern provinces and turn them into a liberated area. The Portuguese retaliate with horrifying massacres. By doing so, they lose face all over the world. Meanwhile, Frei Limo scores military successes and advances more and more into the south. In the end, the young officers in Portugal, who are sick of the senseless wars in faraway Africa, organize a coup d'etat and force their leaders to open negotiations with the liberation movements of Mozambique, Angola and Guinea-Bissau. Frei Limo proves to have enough popular support and after a period of transition, they come into power. In 1975, Mozambique becomes independent. The Portuguese pull out en masse. What remains is the problem of those Mozambicans who were in league with the Portuguese. Frei Limo believes that everyone has the possibility to change and was therefore willing to forgive those who had betrayed the country. But first, they had to denounce themselves so that the people would know who they were, face up to the past, suffer the shame. This rehabilitation meeting does away with the old contradiction between collaboration and resistance. Senhores, compatriotas e comprometidos. Qual é o melhor termo? Ah? Compatriotas. Ok, obrigado. Obrigado. Compatriotas. Senhores membros do partido, membros do governo da República Popular de Moçambique, camaradas militantes, compatriotas moçambicanos, a pergunta será. Tanta concentração de estruturas, para quê? Estas estruturas são o resultado da vitória do povo moçambicano sobre o colonialismo. É o produto da vitória, é a razão da nossa luta. E vocês também são.
trata-se daqueles moçambicanos cujas fotografias mandamos afixar quando em 11 de novembro de 1988 procedemos ao encerramento da campanha nacional de estruturação do partido. Muitos se perguntaram a razão desta medida. Uns não compreenderam o seu objetivo. Outros diziam que o passado era passado, não havia necessidade de o relembrar. É verdade. Só revendo o passado conheceremos o presente. Só conhecendo o presente perspectiva faremos a perspectiva do futuro. This is Jaime Maté, son of a clergyman, 44 years old. As a student without means, he fell into the hands of the PIDA, the Portuguese secret police, who were prepared to pay his studies in exchange for information about the African student movement. Aqui, esta coisa de falar não é bom, não é? Situar as coisas no tempo e no espaço. Pronto, queremos, agora há um movimento grande dos estudantes africanos. Este movimento é de ingresso no ensino secundário. E como controlar estes africanos? Como obtermos informações sobre eles? O que é que eles pensam? O que é que cada um deles quer ser? Então, encontra um terreno fértil em ti para ser infiltrado no seio dos estudantes africanos. Continua, é assim. É, eu, eu continuo os meus estudos, mas nesta altura, eu, é, é, a missão suíça, portanto, que me tinha custeado os estudos até a altura, que me tinha custeado a, 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 os estudos até a conclusão, portanto, do, do segundo ano do ciclo preparatório, é? Convoca-me para eu é, deixar de estudar e continuar, portanto, é, e ir ser afetado numa missão para dar aulas ou é, a tarefa que a igreja me iria confiar. É a igreja essa já? É, é a igreja, portanto, que tinha me pago os estudos. Tinha investido. Tinha investido, portanto, queria Agora obter queria o produto, a queria, queria colher o, o, o produto do trabalho, portanto, que, da, do, do seu investimento. Então, eu nessa altura, não é? Então, recuso. Digo que não, porque já queria estudar, quer dizer, tinha sentido, portanto, e tinha sentido que tinha possibilidade de estudar, uma vez que já tinha sido, portanto, em, eh, ganho por o Sr. Barreiros Gomes, e então vejo aqui a possibilidade de, se efetivamente eu conseguir eh, dar as informações que ele pretende, eu vou lhe pôr em contrapartida, e exatamente que não irá dizer que não. Primeiro passo da traição, marca Primeiro passo da traição. E o resto vem. Sentiram que tu já traíste. Portanto, queriam te salvar. E tu recusaste. Recusaste porque já recebeste a missão da PIDE de espiar os teus irmãos, os teus colegas. Qual era? Quais eram as informações que a PIDE necessitava? O que é que, gostava, o que, é que queria conhecer dos estudantes? E que tu deste. Faz favor. Mas o passo da traição já está dado. Para o resto da tua vida. Ah, está dado ali. Está dado o passo decisivo da traição. O resto são consequências. Faça favor, consolide meu passo, quero ver o passo, a ser consolidado. Portanto, é... Informações, o que é que a PIDE cria dos estudantes? E que tu te prontificaste por dar. É, sempre que ouvir alguém que fale de movimentos africanos, sobre alguém que fale 
a dizer que os portugueses estão a tratar mal os, 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 africanos. os, os africanos. Então, faça para aqui uma informação. Nós vamos garantir, vamos pagar eh, os estudos, vamos arranjar por forma aqui não pagues as propinas eh, eh, na, 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 na escola. escola ou eh, quando necessário, se algum livro for necessário, nós poderemos tratar que através da mocidade portuguesa você possa receber os livros e cadernos e papel que necessitar. Então tinham a data da conta de reuniões? Tinham inclusivamente informações de como é que decorriam as reuniões. Tinham, sim, Sr. Presidente. Então, com base, com base nestas informações, com base nestas informações de, com que traía, portanto, os interesses do povo, eu fui avançando, fui continuando os estudos até 62. Como é que coordenava as informações? Como, como coordenava as informações? E eu... analisava-as através de quem? Através do mesmo elemento, porque... Oh. Esse... Barreiros Gomes. Barreiros Gomes. Barreiros Gomes. É, eu trabalhava, pronto, ficávamos lá todo dia. Ficávamos lá todo dia, porque o... As... Continua a pertencer ao núcleo. Continua a pertencer ao núcleo, continua a estudar, portanto, continua a estudar à noite. E a PIDE a pagar? A PIDE a custear as despesas, portanto, de, de, de estudos. Do, do, dos estudos, portanto, através de isenção de, de propinas e a mocidade portuguesa levantava é, cadernos ou material, é, material que fosse necessário. Então, é... Tens uma história, mas vou mate. Senhor Presidente, a história da traição leva muito tempo, Sr. Presidente. Sabe que alguns têm ódio contra ti, não é? Sei, Sr. Senhor Presidente. Sabe? Sei, Sr. Presidente. Se o Guibuza estivesse aqui, não sei o que seria. Sabe, não sabe? Não, não só, não só. Não, não só. Não só, Sr. Presidente. Alguns responsáveis, nem posso olhar Olha. para eles duas vezes. Olha. Não posso olhar para eles. Eles estão a mexer -se. Eu fui lá olhar para eles. Estão assim. Por causa das atas das reuniões. Mas tu, velho. Mariana, velho. São teus colegas, velho. Reuniões, as atas todas, quando tu dizes, não só as atas, como a agenda e como se discutia, se a discussão era quente, quem são os grandes oradores, defensor do, do nacionalismo. Então, aqui, teus colegas. Peço que me perdoe. aqui pides meus irmãos pides que se venderam venderam a consciência ficaram sem personalidade nós dissemos em 1973 setembro ai de vocês moçambicanos ao serviço do colonialismo não terão lugar quando chegar à altura assim o fizeram os franceses na Indochina vocês não terão lugar nos barcos. E é verdade, deixaram vocês. Não se lembraram de vocês. Tiraram os pides portugueses para serem julgados em Portugal. E vocês foram abandonados aqui. Hã? É verdade. Estás a ver, o papá foi.
Mas por que é que tu ficaste a pedir? Sr. Presidente, várias, várias razões por que é que fiquei, por que é que fiquei da PID. Primeiro, ambição pessoal. Segundo, dificuldades eh, materiais que eu, que eu sentia, portanto, para concretizar eh, essa minha eh, ambição eh, pessoal. Essa foi uma, da, uma das segundas razões. Terceira razão, porque embora tivesse habilitações literárias, posso, eh, se me permitir, dizer que nós éramos analfabetos políticos, Nunca, não sabíamos o que era a independência, não, não tínhamos nenhum sentido da independência. Segundo, outro ponto, havia alienação. O colonialismo eh, tinha instrumentos que possibilitavam a alienação das, das pessoas. Eh, Lembro-me perfeitamente que, por volta de 1960 ou 61, eles tinham um programa que chamava, eh, que era radiofundido eh, às 12 horas, que diziam que Moscou, Moscou não, não, fala, não, fala, não fala a verdade. A verdade é só uma. O Rádio Moscou não fala a verdade. E dizia, é o grilo. Mesquitela também, mesquitela. Estou dizendo a pida ali. Mas pode me dizer quantos, pelo menos, que tu tens consciência de terem sido presos por causa da tua denúncia? Senhor Presidente, não sei efetivamente quantas pessoas. Sei que denunciei muitas pessoas, Senhor Presidente. Não, não posso dizer que foram quantas pessoas porque não, não, havia, é, relato, não, não havia informação de que fulano... É que tu conhecias. Depois da denúncia, é preso. É claro. É claro. Esse é o ponto. Tu conheces, denuncias, pois é preso a pessoa, não é verdade? É muito fácil. Só perguntar coisas do seu milagre. Não. Não, não são coisas do seu milagre, Sr. Presidente. É, o problema é, é este. Eu não quero os nomes. Os nomes eu posso pedir em outro lugar. Não, Sr. Presidente. Eu só quero dizer... Hum, pelo menos 10. Só isso, só. Senhor Presidente. Pelo menos 11. Ao longo destes anos todos, foram... ao serviço da PIB. Foram muitos, Senhor Presidente. Foram muitos. Não, não é por isso é que tenho dificuldade. Não posso dizer quantos foram, Senhor Presidente. Não posso dizer quantos foram. Então, foram muitos. Foram, sim, Senhor Presidente, porque se o indivíduo... E as crianças e a mulher em casa? As crianças e a mulher. O senhor Maté denunciou, foi preso. Está de avanguarda, não é verdade? É, senhor presidente. Às vezes deportado para a ilha de Ibo. E que hoje só podemos reconhecer as balas comuns através das palmeiras. Cada palmeira que faz isto na ilha de Ibo os adubos, os fertilizantes, é o corpo de moçambicano, denunciado pelos agentes da PIB e morto pelos agentes da PIB. Destruição dos lares. As mulheres e as crianças cujos pais foram presos porque o agente da PIDE denunciou -os. Às vezes não é por razão política. Questões pessoais.
This is Inoka Libombo, 76 years old. He was a member of the PIDA and delegate of the fascist party AMP. He became a nationally known figure because of his pro-Portuguese speeches. Eu fui dirigente do Centro Associativo dos Negros de Moçambique. Fui um dos fundadores. A princípio, todos estávamos reunidos nos estatutos, nos livros de, 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 de matrícula do Grêmio Africano. Mas nós, homens negros, notamos um, um certo rebaixamento, um, um, um certo desprezo, afastamento. Dependia das circunstâncias, dos momentos. Quando tocava alguma música, dirigíamos-nos às damas, às damas, a certas damas. A dama, Deixa... a damas. É, Sr. Presidente. A damas comum, a damas consideradas de classe elevada. E sempre apanhávamos Desculpa a expressão. Tampa. Uh, tampa. Ah, ok. Andrão. Eu, quando fugi, vocês estavam em convulsões no centro. 1963, janeiro. Convulsões grandes no centro do centro. Filipane, Inoc, falecido Levi, Levi, Massimiano. E... Havia uma campanha anti-libombo. Estava, se não estou em erro, Samuel Magaia. Salomão Magaia. É. Salomão Magaia. Hum? Depois, eu estando lá na floresta, soube que o senhor Enoque Libombo era muito protegido pelo, coloni pelo colonial fascismo. E construíram residência em Spamanini. E nessa altura já era protegido porque os pretos consideravam Enoque Bombo Traidor. Quantas vezes viajou a Portugal, Olha, Bom? A primeira vez foi em 1954. O outro foi em 3. 53, senhor presidente. 53, sim. Quando o funcionário... Recordo-me, nessa altura eu fazia 20 anos. Quando funcionário da Câmara. Da Câmara Municipal. Eu fui a Portugal, evidentemente, beneficiando, beneficiando das regalias que o, funciona, o funcionário tem. Muitos não foram, não, não, não aproveitaram. Não porque desdenhasse o contato com os portugueses. Não. Uns podia ser isso, não há dúvida nenhuma. Mas outros, enfim, não, não, não tinham interesse, não tinham interesse. E, e eu fui. Foi daí que nasceu o grande ódio contra mim. O grande ódio. A não aceitação por parte mesmo dos meus colaboradores no centro. Porque viam estas facilidades. Não me quero esquecer. Quando foi do dia dos PIDES, nesse dia do julgamento dos PIDES, toda a gente dizia, agora chegou a vez do Libombo. Agora chegou a vez do Libombo. <risos> Sabe, que bom. A Frelimo educou-nos de tal maneira para respeitarmos a vida das pessoas e respeitar a pessoa humana. Respeitar. Em 
ensinou-nos o valor da generosidade. Isso é um valor revolucionário. Ensinou-nos que só os homens pequenos fazem vinganças. Os homens pequenos fazem vinganças. Parece um dito africano. A form... O elefante não consegue ver a formiga. Não é verdade? Sim. Agora, eu, presidente da República Popular de Moçambique, perseguir um cidadão. O elefante procurar pisar formiga. Hum? Estás a ver ele, bom? Sim. Por isso, eu estou satisfeito porque tu tens consciência de que o povo, estes mesmo, disseram, agora chegou a vez do bom para ser julgado. E... Porque fez muitos discursos também, não é? Tempo Fiz. Colonial. Está a ver, bom? Fiz, presidente. Fiz. De desagravos, quando Portugal era condenado pelas Nações Unidas, o colonialismo português, Organizavam-se manifestações de desagravos. E o Libovo tomava púlpito, fazia discursos. Sim, senhor, isto é Portugal, é porque isto, é porque aquilo, enfim. 20 discursos. Chega, chegamos a assumir esse valor, que somos portugueses de fato. Mas nós estamos conscientes que tu não és português. Tu és moçambicano. Não entrou com coisa nenhuma. Por isso, o governo era porque tinha que ser dele. Agora, quando esta manhã procurei por ti, onde tem esta presença de gente. Obrigado, Presidente. Obrigado. Eu procurei, descobri que não tinha sido avisado. Dissemos, parece o lugar melhor mais indicado, conveniente, é aqui onde estamos a falar dos problemas nacionais, onde estamos a falar do nosso passado, onde queremos perspectivar, queremos o engajamento de cada moçambicano para com o nosso povo, identificação completa para com o nosso povo, esse que é o nosso objetivo. Identificar-se com a pátria moçambicana. As lutas de libertação têm heróis, têm traidores. Na União Soviética, até 1934, triunfou a Revolução em outubro de 1917. Confrontaram-se com a reação até 1934. Opunham-se às mudanças. Foram derrotados só em 1934. E em 1939 até 1944, de novo, Aproveitando-se da, da Segunda Guerra Mundial. Reacionários nacionais. Reacionários nacionais. Ligados às forças exteriores. Na China, a guerra durou. É a guerra mais prolongada da nossa época. A guerra durou 22 anos consecutivos. 10 anos de guerra civil. Oito anos contra o Japão. Quatro anos contra Chiang Kai-shek. E fugiu, foi ocupar a ilha de Taiwan, conhecida aqui em Moçambique, Ilha Formosa, China nacionalista de Chiang Kai-shek, traidor. No Vietnã, como sabem, a derrota maior na história, derrotar uma potência superpotência, Estados Unidos da América, 
Puseram no Vietnã um milhão de soldados. Transformaram o Vietnã num laboratório de experiência da resistência humana. Aviões B-58, B-52. Os Phantom foram experimentados no Vietnã. A guerra química foi experimentada no Vietnã. Os efeitos até hoje. Mas em abril de 1975, os americanos saíram com as caças nas mãos. Porque há uma coisa que nunca trai na vida. Na história, o povo nunca trai. O povo nunca trai. O povo, os homens, sim. É o povo que nunca morre. O povo não morre. Gerações e gerações, nós fizemos a guerra na Revolução Nacional, inspirados pela guerra de resistência contra o ocupado para invadir o Moçambique. Derrot Fomos derrotados nessa altura por causa de traidores nacionais. Por isso, nós não estranhamos. É o fenômeno natural. É um fenômeno histórico. Guerra de libertação. Produz heróis, produz traidores. The President has asked all those who know something about the notorious massacres of colonial times to step forward and speak. Two ex-commandos were witnesses at the massacre of Wiriamu. Sobre o massacre do Wiriamu, eu estava presente, Sr. Presidente. Estava presente. Foi no dia 18 de dezembro de 1972, quando o nosso comandante, na altura era o segundo comandante da companhia, porque o capitão, que era o nosso comandante efetivo, estava de férias, salvo erro. Recebeu instruções da ZOT, Zona Operacional de Teto. Instruções essas que foram dadas pelo coronel, que estava como comandante da ZOT. Como se chamava? Desculpe, senhor presidente. É o seu nome. É aquele que tinha sido... Vocês da imprensa quase que não estão confirmados. Nós elaboraremos mais tarde. É aquele que tinha sido governador? Senhor Presidente, não sei ah? como é que se chamava. Ah? Martins? Venha cá, companheiro. Faça favor, de... não diz o teu nome também. Como se chamava o coronel da época, em O coronel que era o comandante da ZOT e governador simultaneamente era o Martins Videira. Martins Videira? Exatamente, senhor governador. Era Martins Videira, era um coronel paraquedista. Coronel paraquedista? Exatamente, senhor. Obrigado. Pode esperar um pouco aí? Obrigado. Espera aqui, coronel. Continua. Escreva a minha operação. É, nesse dia, o nosso comandante de companhia, neste caso era o segundo comandante, António Melo, recebeu instruções para uh, assaltarmos o aldeamento que estava nas imediações, que era um aldeamento suspeito. Participou nessa, nessa operação, aviação, os Tietes e os bombardeiros D6. Uh, D6? D6. D6 são os Hã? D6 são os Outro nome não sei. Como é. Não. Continuam. Saímos do estacionamento. Participaram G91, Fiat. Fiat e bombardeiros bombarde D6. D6. Uh, além dos dois grupos que tinham sido largados no dia, nos dias anteriores, dois ou um, nesse dia 18, equiparam dois grupos, primeiro e segundo grupo. O primeiro grupo, que era o próprio da, o grupo da, do comandante, e o segundo grupo, que era do outro alferes. Portanto, éramos 50 homens. Cada grupo era, era composto por 25 elementos. 
E juntaram-se a nós, salvo erro, acima de 15, não se nos quer contar, acima de 15 elementos da PID. Portanto, para reforçar e ao mesmo tempo fazer investigações. Porque eles é que tinham instruções do que é que se passava nesse aldeamento. E, e nós, os da PID. Os da PID. Comunicaram ao exército. Exatamente, senhor presidente. Eles é que tinham conhecimento do que é que se passava nesse, nesse aldeamento. Deram instruções ao, ao, ao comandante de companhia que tudo quanto encontrássemos nesse aldeamento era para deitar abaixo. É, vieram dois helicópteros que nos levaram ao local. Chegados ao local, então, o comandante da companhia mandou espalhar, isto é, montar segurança ao, aos soldados em volta do aldeamento. E os da PID começaram então a fazer interrogatórios. Interrogatórios esses, penso eu, eh, baseavam-se em eh, procurar saber quem que é o régulo da, do aldeamento, se a população tinha ligação ou não com a Frelimo. O que se apurou na altura, Sr. Presidente, não sei dizer. Simplesmente começaram então a, eh, começamos a ouvir bombardeamentos de granadas de mão. Isto é, juntavam as populações e atiravam as granadas para o meio, de, para o meio delas. Como o, o comandante da ZOD tinha, tido, tinha dado instruções que tudo quanto encontrássemos deitássemos abaixo, ficou com remorso era, era, para responder perante o comandante da ZOD. O capitão. O, o, o capitão ficou com remorso. Mas mesmo assim, não, se, não manifestou. Fecharam, fechavam as pessoas nas palhotas e atiravam granadas para dentro das palhotas. Fina então a operação. Queimaram as palhotas ao mesmo tempo. Fina também a operação. Eh, o capitão, nosso capitão, mandou então retirar-nos da zona. E assim regressamos. Ah, é. Senhor Presidente, foi a, acima de 100 pessoas. De que idade? Liquidar-se. Ouviram? 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 Caça bombardeiros de Mirages. E largaram bom... Fiat. Fiat. Fiat queria, queria dizer. G91. Fiat G91. Largaram bombas e começamos a ouvir turreteiro no meio. O nosso comandante do grupo recusou-se a avançar. Que categoria tinha? Era Alferes. Português também? Não era português, era moçambicano, breu. Está aqui. Não se encontra em Moçambique. Oh. Fugiu. Não sei quais as razões que lhe levaram a fugir, mas não se encontra no país. Recusou-se a... Como avanç... se chamava o nome completo deste alfabeto? É o Abreu. Abreu. Uhum. E permanecemos na zona, alguns furriês do nosso grupo português, que já não se encontra cá, e contiram alguns dos nossos colegas para avançar, mas encontraram resistência no grupo. Ninguém avançou do nosso grupo. No dia seguinte de manhã, avançamos para encontrar com os outros grupos que tinham avançado o sexto, primeiro e segundo, que tinham sido largados de helicópteros. Eu vi muitos cadáveres, não sei dizer quantos. Então, quando chega o, um dos grupos, que vinha acompanhado do comandante da PID DGS, o Chico Feio, apareceu uma criança que estava escondida no meio de uma palhota. O Chico Feio mandou correr a criança e disparou contra ela. Isso presenciei eu. Passado sensivelmente oito a doze dias, de madrugada, à volta das cinco e meia, seis horas, foram selecionados nas baracas alguns elementos que não identificaram, não disseram qual era a missão daqueles elementos escolhidos e avançaram 
Só quando voltaram, regressaram à tarde é que tomamos conhecimento que tinham sido escolhidos para enterrar os cadáveres daquele massacre. Depois de 12 dias. Ou mais, Sr. Presidente. Ou mais. Sim, Senhor. E foi-lhes dito que não deviam revelar nada a, a, ao resto dos elementos que não tinham, não tinham sido indicados para lá para, eh, participarem. Fizeram esse trabalho há cerca de três ou quatro dias. A enterrar. A enterrar. Saiam de manhã e voltavam à noite. É tudo quanto eu sei Obrigado. sobre o massacre do Guerião. Faça um favor, minutos para limpar a vocês. Digam lá, vocês são militares. Quantos minutos? Um pelotão de 25 homens armados de G3. Quantos minutos? Sim, ordem para trás para ver o número de vocês. Depois dar uns minutos. Quantos minutos? Comandos, quantos minutos para estes? Hã? Meio minuto. com as mãos? Com as mãos. A reunião conduz aqui, cada um. Olhe para si próprio. E assuma na sua integridade o seu passado. O passado, a história, não se negam. Há que olhar de frente para eles, para garantir que o nosso presente e o futuro não sejam triste repetição desse passado. Não se trata nem de esquecer, nem de negar a existência dos vossos crimes. Trata-se sim de pela coragem em assumir o passado, pelo trabalho honesto na reconstrução nacional, pela dedicação em defender a pátria, ultrapassar o passado, renascer como um homem novo. Esta reunião traz-vos a consciência de que são moçambicanos, têm uma pátria, pertencem a um povo. Compatriotas, nesta reunião só pude participar uma pequena parte dos comprometidos que existem no nosso país. Mas tudo o que estamos a dizer, e em particular as tarefas que vos da, vamos dar, que já muita grande área já foi definida por vocês, respeitam a todos os moçambicanos no país. Até ao dia 20 de junho, até a semana de celebração da Fundação da Frelima e da Independência Nacional, nos locais onde estão afixadas as vossas fotografias, os órgãos do partido deverão organizar reuniões com todos os trabalhadores e todos os comprometidos desse local de trabalho para se retirarem as fotografias já fixadas e explicar o vosso processo de libertação. Durante cinco 
cinco dias falamos do passado. Mas o nosso objetivo é construir o futuro, é assegurar a felicidade, é assegurar o bem-estar, a paz e a tranquilidade para todo o povo moçambicano. Queremos agora que partam daqui para os vossos lares, para as vossas famílias, para os vossos locais de trabalho, como homens refeitos e confiantes. Queremos que vocês vivam e assumam os valores da nova sociedade. Queremos que vocês enterrem conscientemente o cadáver do passado e se engajem na defesa da independência e da liberdade. Sejamos todos Incorporemos-nos num só homem, num só punho, para a defesa da liberdade, para a defesa da independência, para a defesa da pátria moçambicana, para a formação da nação moçambicana forte e próspera. A luta continua, a revolução vencerá, o socialismo triunfará. O apelo, façam cair todos esses para cá, já não há PID, não há NP, não há GES, não há Mas Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, yeah, that was great to uh, see that. Um, um, yeah, I love, I actually really love this documentary a lot um, <laughs> because I just think that it shows a lot um, about like the deep, uh, like a deep accountability and uh, the dialectical nature of, of socialism and how, you know, We can't always import everything that other revolutions have done into our own, especially being Africans. We have our own uh, um, African personality and our own revolutionary um, ideas and stuff like that. And so we can't just be, we have to do things different. And so, yeah, I'll just start with that. But yeah, what, what were your thoughts? Um, what are your initial thoughts, Monica? Thanks, Rashad. So it was my first time seeing the film and I'm still sitting with a, uh, the um like i'm a very forgiving person and i'm still sitting with the the power um that the president of mozambique um exhibited for the value of mercy and so i'm still sitting with that and reflecting on what that means and what that looks like um now or, or what that could look like so it was very um I'm just sitting with it and processing what that looks like. Cause yeah. I no, keep going. Oh no, that that that's it. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because you know, I'm <laughs> it's the same for me. I mean, I I've watched this multiple times before actually, but at the same time, it's still 
you know, I mentioned how, you know, the first guy, you know, um, the first um, uh, collaborator or trader uh, that they were talking to during the documentary, he was a former student and why he was, you know, uh, betraying the people. He was a student and, um, you know, the Portuguese fascist government, because at the time Portugal was ran by a fascist, um, a fascist dictator named, um, Ah oh, man, I'm gonna look up his name. I can't remember his name, but he was like, yeah, he was real. He was a super fascist dude, and they were, they were insane over there in Portugal. And um, so yeah, so you know, the Portuguese uh, government, fascist government, they told him they were gonna pay for all of his schooling and stuff like that. And he decided to, you know, take the money, uh, take the schooling, and betray his own people. But you know, him, I don't know. I just it, it was hard because, like, I mean, I think he deserved what he, you know, obviously he deserved to have to take accountability. And you know, show his face and tell his story and why he collaborated with the with the enemy. But I did feel it was hard because I mean, I did feel, I do feel bad for him and stuff like that. And uh, you know, you want to like hate these people. You want to be like, oh, you're you're a traitor. You betrayed our people. And then you you know when when they do things like this, when some more Michelle and revolutions do things like this, where it's like deep accountability and transformative justice type um, ways of going about interacting with our people. It's like, well, yeah, man, he did. I mean, it's not like he had a reason, but he was co-opted by the enemy. And the enemy is powerful. They do things. They know how to manipulate people. He's a young college kid. They know how to get to vulnerable people, especially ones poor people like us and stuff like that. And so obviously we don't, con we don't condone what he did. And clearly they weren't in, the, <laughs> in uh, 1975, 1976 Mozambique. But at the same time, you know, um, you do feel for them and stuff like that. The people who had to like, you know, who have... Um, who got co-opted and were actually felt like they were sorry and stuff like that. I actually really did feel like they were sorry. Yeah. Yeah. When I was watching it, the first thing I was thinking about is how both can be true. Like the conflicting things can be happening where it's like, man, I love our people. And the traders also committed these uh, hinderous horror acts under colonization and both can be true. And um, what I, what uh, the first speaker who was who was talking, um, he was like, I didn't know what it meant for like the fighting for our independence, you know. And so it was making me think about now of how we're talking about African liberation and how we're talking about colonization and how it harms our people. And um, what does that look like for people to really understand of um you know, committing class suicide, um, also getting involved in revolutionary organizing. Like, how do we get people to that space so that they can see it? Because I think he embodied that saying, like, he didn't, he didn't realize, like, he was fighting his own people in, in that space. Like, he didn't realize that he could have made a more of a contribution to um, his people, like, as a freedom fighter for the liberation of our people. And what was also interesting to me what the president was saying in Mozambique is how it was toward the end, how it was like, you no longer have this title of like traitors hanging over you. Um, you are part of building, rebuilding Mozambique. You are Mozambicans. Like you have to like, like the stressing and understanding of that. It made me like, I was so connected as like, we are Africans and like how we have to understand that. And um, not having this identity with the um, United Snakes, right? Because like we've been conditioned to uh, have that identity, and and um, uh, and like, what does it mean to have an African identity? Yeah, definitely. And I like the fact that you know, uh, not like the fact, but you know, it's interesting because they, you know, a lot of people, even especially the ones that you know you're talking about over here in the Snakes who have this, you know, they have this uh, um, sort of affection and like connection to America. And I, you know, we understand we're born here. The fucking, um, you know, I love, I love so-called Denver, Colorado. I love my people here and stuff like that. I, I like, I really enjoyed growing up here and everything like that. But at the same point in time, we're not Americans. And so I like the, the you know, the juxtaposition of the fact that, you know, um, a lot of them don't feel like our people over there are, you know, the African, our people on the continent are actually our people, you know, 
we're, people over here are trying to identify with Americans and stuff like that. But they got the same stuff going on over there that we got going on over here because of the system of colonization. And so, you know, they had to deal with um, people feeling like they're Portuguese, you know, that dude Limbobo, the old guy, the older elder gentleman, Limbobo, who had made speeches and stuff like that for the Portuguese. And Samora Rochelle was saying, like, you, you made some of these speeches, he was almost Portuguese. It almost seemed like he was Portuguese. And he's like, but no, he was actually Mozambican. But that's how, you know, that's how connected our struggles are and stuff like that, because the same like type of, you know, psychological warfare of turning people into um, so-called the, the colonizers and making them identify so much with the colonizing power. Uh, that's something we're dealing with all over. And so <laughs> I just think that's, you know, it's, it's really interesting that you mentioned that. Thank you so much, comrade. Uh, my internet's going in and out, so it kicked me out of Zoom for a minute there, so I, I lost the last sentence that you said. Um, uh, but glad I'm back on. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, for the Felimo values, you know, he highlighted about respect for human life, the importance of mercy, and how like that all is um, connected and aligned to like the revolutionary value. And so it was like the respect for human life, they took human life and the value to have mercy and seeing how those are parallel to one another through like the words. And imagine they went through five days of testimonials, right? So hearing, you know, these are just snippets. We didn't get to see full five days of testimonials. We got to hear a handful of snippets and just imagine just like sitting and hearing and listening to um, and people in the audience, it could have been their family members and really being able to um, have like that mercy, that value of mercy for your own people. Um, and you talked about it earlier about like restorative justice, like what happened was like transformative justice, you know? Um, it was like how they're responsible and accountable to their actions. What does that look like? how that harmed others. And so others can share how that harmed them. And then the transformation is like, and now your photos are released. You know, they don't have to be posted in these spaces. And now you're Mozambicans and you are part of um, build, building like our space together, building our community together. And that's like huge transformative space that like I want to even I want to definitely grow in and I'm a forgiving person and I know like just in just watching the videos for me it was very heavy of 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 thinking about um the massive graves and bodies um that were occurring because of colonization right and he also talked about how like and Peter left you you see they're not here they're not here at all. And so that's what we have to understand. These colonizers don't give a fuck about us at all, at all. They want us to, contri con to contribute to our own destruction, to our people's destruction. They do not care. And the president, like so much, the love, and even in the space, the applause, the throwing down the slimes, like our people, like how we can really love one another. And like that whole thing for me was like unity like how unity, how it embodied unity. And um, cause these colonizers don't care about you. They don't care if you, they live or die. But if you live or die, even, even though you contribute to the destruction of our people. And so that, that's what we see now. And so I feel like there's so much to learn in that space um, about how these colonizers don't care for us. Yep. And in the chat, um, Emma, uh... Emma, a.k.a. Vol Vol, she was saying, you know, just basically what you're saying, that we can identify with our colonizers as much as we want to do, as much as we feel like we're Americans or we're Portuguese or we're fucking French because we're from uh, uh, Guinea Conakry and stuff like that, or Guinea Bissau or Burkina Faso. We're not those things. We are African people. And so as much as we want to identify with them, it's just they don't give a shit. Like you're saying, like Emma saying in the chat, once you're once they're once they decide to leave, if you're not of the right class, if you can't, if you're not going to advance uh, Portuguese or American um, capitalism, you're gone. Man. And so even if you do have a little education, if we gave you a little education, 
give a shit. You, you ain't going to do nothing with it anyway. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you're not going to fucking rise up because that's not how capitalism works. And they know that shit. You're not going to rise up and be some uh, be on their level. And they know that. So, all right, you can you can you can either, you know, get sacrificed by your people. But either way, we're gone. They did the same thing in Afghanistan. You know, they're going over there to supposedly help those folks. And then they leave and the people who was co- collaborating with the Americans over in Afghanistan, you know, you see them like trying to gather the planes and the planes is taking off and stuff like that. They're they're dangling basically from the planes a couple of years ago um, while Americans are just leaving, taking off and leaving, the, you know, all the people they collaborated with to be questioned or killed or whatever by the, by the forces that, you know, may have the... They have the right, whatever, you know, I feel about or we feel about, you know, what Frilimo did and how they went about this and stuff like that. I agree with it and stuff like that. But those people, some of those people do have a right to feel like they want to uh, get rid of and, and disappear these people who collaborated with the colonialists and and uh, played a hand in their family members and friends dying and all these massacres. They have a right to feel like that and stuff like that. And so, um <laughs> You know, they'll leave you to those people, the, the colonialists and the, the imperialists, they'll leave you to those people who want to see you gone because of the actions you did. So you might as well fight for the people, because like some more Michelle said in the documentary, the people might betray, but they're, the people will never commit treason and stuff like that because the people never die. And so you might as well join on us, join with us, join the people and fight these motherfuckers because we will take care of our own. And we will try and make sure that we can transform people and that we understand the dialectical nature of socialism and human nature in general, that everybody can change. And so, um, yeah. Thanks, Rashad. I was wondering, what did you think about his comments, Um, President uh, Samar Michelle, when he was talking about how Vietnam, how it tested human resistance and how it was a defeat of um, the United Snakes. Like, what did you, what were some of your thoughts when that was shared? Oh man, I love that. I love that he, you know, I love that he went through like a brief history about other revolutions, but Vietnam, man, Vietnam is important to humanity in general, because like, you know, like he said, that's a, that's a defeat for that's a, a defeat for, for history. You know what I mean? Like they, them, them, that powerful army, you know, they, they, they're fighting the French, they're fighting America. They're getting carpet bombed. Like it's nothing, you know, they're still finding, they're still finding ancient orange and, and mines in Vietnam to this day, to this day. And so like that, you know, these people who had limited resources, um, limited weaponry, um, limited experience in like fighting wars um, in the fashion that um, America was trying to fight, but they, you know, people, and I'm reading a book right now by uh, Chairman Mao, uh, Unprotracted War, and he talks about in here, he talks about in here about how people are the most important thing in a war. Weapons, obviously they matter, we understand that power, um, resources, economic resources, they matter, but the people is the defining factor in wars and in revolution in general. Because um, we represent the, all the things that um, we, people represent all the things that can be. Um, we re- honestly represent di- <laughs> dialectics in its in its nature because you know what I mean. Like we we have the ability to change. We have the ability to to see things through and to if we're on the wrong side for our morale to be lessened and stuff like that. So it's the people that matter. And so for Vietnam to defeat them, it's just we owe humanity owes Vietnam so much because they did so much for us just by fighting back just by resisting and then not only to mention the fact that they did it but they won they kicked the motherfuckers out the country and like some more michelle said had their tails behind their legs america still don't want to admit that they lost in vietnam i still hear vietnam vets um talking about oh no we didn't we didn't lose we uh we bowed out we uh we left no y'all niggas lost man y'all motherfuckers lost sorry <laughs> No, thank you for sharing that reflection. I was thinking about too, um, the solidarity actions that were happening in other countries and in this countries that were in opposition to the war in Vietnam too. And um, like to resist uh, of like, why would like sending our people over there to die for 
um, this country's uh, like greed and imperialism. And so I was just reflecting about like the anti-war coalition work that happens here in collaboration with other um, organizations and how it's so critical that we are um, speaking out on those things. Uh, so yeah. And the other thing um, I thought was really interesting, it was talking about how it said, oh, they'll know the names of the heroes and they'll know the names of the traitors. And I was, and when it, it, he said it like three times and I was, uh, I, we still were talking about this in work study one time, how um, I forgot whose funeral it was at. Was it John? I forgot whose funeral it was at. I'm so sorry. Um, but how they bought up Kwame's, how the pre, uh, former president, you know, bought up Kwame. Uh, yeah, John Lewis. Okay, I thought it was John Lewis. I don't want to like say, um, but how like Kwame Ture's name um, being out of pocket in a space that doesn't need to happen, right? But this is a, um, where it's a, a live funeral where so many people can see it. And like, you know, um, Kwame Ture is revolutionary leader for fighting for the uh, liberation of our people. Uh, and so um, like, they know he's a hero. They know he's a revolutionary uh, hero, uh, uh, leader. And so like his name um, being bought up in that space is because of the opposition, right? Uh, of, of what this country stands for. And so that was interesting to me about they'll know the names of, of the heroes, like we'll know the names of the revolutionary leaders and how it's important we get to know their names. We get to, important to know about the, the history. Like this was my first time I'm learning about um, the massacres in Mozambique and uh, the um, colonization that the Portuguese did in that space. So just so much to learn um, and how it's real critical that we learn about um, revolutionary leaders um, and the why. I think the why is so important. And so in this space, the why for me that I'm really taking away is um, the concepts of both being true, of like loving our people and the mercy for our people. And I think about that because we have a lot of people a lot of our people, you know, we're, we're colonized people and we've forgotten who we are and our colonization has been in, intentional. And we, they, they taught us to divide um, and, and they taught us about individualism. Even, even that one guy was talking about, oh, I did this for personal gain, right? And so how we really, really have to not focus on that personal gain and really see all of us as connected, all of us as collective. And so um, it's like things that we talk about all the time, but it was just really elevated in this space that there was so much destruction, so much horror, and yet like how collectivism was the most important thing like that, that, I, that I'm really going to take with me from this space. And so, um, yeah. I'm going to pause right there. No, oh, yeah, because, you know, um, to your to your first to your initial point about, you know, remembering uh, that the people will always remember our uh, our heroes and our trade. And we also to that uh, to that fact will remember our traitors. And so I think it's funny because I think here we have a little bit of we have that because, you know, we remember. We remember um, we remember Moses, we remember uh Malcolm X, we remember Martin Luther King, but at the same time, they've, they've tried to siphon our heroes off from their ideologies and from the, from their ways of thinking, from their organizing tactics, from the organizations that they were in, if they were in organizations, from the work that they were doing. And so not only uh, do you remember our people, but it's still limited. And also the state has done such a good job of trying to like uh, separate the people from the movements and separate the people from the ways of thinking and from the ideologies and stuff like that. So that we only have a picture of Malcolm and we have what they tell us and stuff like that. So although we do remember and stuff like that, it's the state knows that, you know, they, I'm not saying they watched the, I'm not saying they were there listening to some more Michelle. I mean, I'm sure they probably were, but either way, they, they know, okay, well, how, how do we get colonized people to not do stuff like that, to not remember their heroes, to, to forget about them, to, 
um, to leave them by the wayside and stuff like that. And that's, you know, I think they've done a decent job, but at the same time, you could tell that you could tell our people have that connection and we want to have it and we're searching for it. And a lot of people are getting it back and we're getting back into contact with our radical history. And we're learning about the people who actually did the fighting for us and stuff like that. And the ones who we do know we're diving deeper into them and stuff like that. And that's the work you got to do. Yeah, I agree. The internet is providing so much access to where there's so much political education out there. There's blogs, there's videos, there's history on all different ancestors. And like you said, they, they decompartmentalize um, people connected to organizations. Like you don't even hear people talking about um, Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, being against Vietnam, but you hear the, I have a dream speech, right. Of, 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 of unity of, 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 um, different race, uh, different race ethnicities. Um, I know race is a social construct, um, but like, that's what you hear, right? Cause it's like, we need to be one America. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, that's never going to happen, but that's what promoted on, the, on, on MLK. Like it, that's what's promoted. That's what's uplifted. Um, the, you said something, sorry, I just got distracted by my son. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. The other thing I think about is even like black history month, even does that isolation because it's it doesn't elevate from my observation like 90 percent of the time it's not elevating necessarily revolutionary leaders but it's really elevating um uh the first president the first astronaut the first this the first that and so it's talking about the first connected to this society and this society's values um not necessarily connected to the values of um, the struggles of the people. Uh, And so that's another way too, that they're able to condition us, right? Um, uh, Through that like representation lens versus like um, learning about like even this, this film, right? This isn't a film that we'll see elevated during uh, African History Month, like we won't see things like that. Exactly. And so, you know, you know, um, like you said, you know, they'll tell us, they'll tell us about these things and um, they'll tell us about, if they do tell us about some more, Michelle, they won't tell us about Free Limo. They won't tell us about the the structures um, that are um, in the organizations that these people are tied to. And so, um, yeah, and, and, and they try and separate us from those things in general. They don't want us to organize. They don't want us to form mass political organizations. They don't want us um, connecting the dots and stuff like that. They don't, they don't want stuff like that. And so, um, you know, um, another thing about that is, uh, like I guess to, um, someone put in the chat that today is Fidel Castro's birthday. And so this is another thing that, like, they try and tell us who are exactly. Uh, uh, happy birthday to Comrade Fidel. Um, and he rests in forever peace and revolutionary uh, love because they try and they, another thing they try to do besides if they're not going to tell us about our people, they're going to demonize them. And so, you know, Fidel Castro, he represents, um, he represents the leader of an African revolution. And we, I heard this talked about on uh, Black Power Media um, a couple, maybe like a week or so ago, um, Dr. Jared Ball was having a discussion with the organizer out in Atlanta, uh, Devin Springer. And so um, they were talking about how we should we have to we could we should start um, we should start recognizing the Cuban Revolution as an African Revolution and all of these victories that we've had Cuba um, Venezuela um, Mozambique these are these are African these are African victories these are African revolutions and if we start to 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 connect ourselves to that to the freedom struggle of humanity, to the freedom struggle of Africans around the globe, that's when we'll start getting real change, especially here in the snakes and stuff like that, or any colonized people. When we start to link up with our people and other colonized people who aren't Africans, and we start to really realize our struggles are linked in the fight against imperialism and for socialism or for humanity and the the advancement of humanity, well, then we'll start to get somewhere. Because right now, you know, they, they, the state and the imperialist, the Euro-American, their values, like you're saying, they are, they're, they're seeping into our bloodstream and they've been doing it for so long that, you know, 
that is that is there for a lot of our people and stuff like that. And we feel like we really are American and, um, you know, we're proud of being the first black and stuff like that. Uh, real quick, though, I just it's crazy because, you know, to this point, Max Stanford, um, he has a quote and he's talking about and that we aren't American citizens. And, you know, I know a lot of us have heard this, but Max Stanford or Muhammad Ahmad, he was the uh, creator of uh, RAM, Revolutionary Action Movement. He has a statement where he's talking about we aren't American citizens. We're a colonized and captive group of people held like almost held hostage by America. We're not able to get our freedom. We never relinquished our sovereignty, but they got us here and they're controlling us. They're able to decide what uh, um, what resources go to our kids, how, to, how they're gonna educate our kids, um, when we get to go to jail, how long we're in jail. They decide all this shit for us. And we never relinquished our sovereignty. We're still our own nation of 40 million people here linked up with 1.4 billion Africans globally. And so, you know, we, that's something we have to remember. And the fact that their values aren't our values ever. And we have to reclaim our shit. Yeah, that's deep. And so. Um, what, is, what was the term? That what term? You said revolutionary action. You said. Oh, yeah. RAM, Revolutionary Action Movement. It was started by. Um, by um, Max Stanford, um, former uh, Muhammad Ahmad, formerly known as Max Max Stanford. Um, pretty sure it was in Philly, and um, yeah, he actually tried to get Malcolm X to be their uh, their um, uh, to be their you know national spokesperson. Um, another interview on Black Power Media, um, Kalanji Jamachanga, he has one on Riot Starter with uh, Muhammad Ahmad and they talk about Ram and how he tried to recruit, uh, Malcolm X and stuff like that. And so, you know, that's another thing, like, you know, they don't, I never heard of Mac. I never heard of Max Stanford before I heard, I'd heard of Ram, but I, you don't hear about nothing that they did before. I never, I just heard, Oh, Ram. Okay. And then, you know, I, I watched the interview with, um, with Kalani, uh, Kalanji Jamachanga on Black Bar Media. And I was like, okay, wow. So you, you know, he, they've been there from almost the beginning, right after the civil rights movement. He's trying to, you know, after Malcolm X left the NOI, he's trying to connect, you know, he's trying to get Malcolm X into RAM. And so we don't hear about none of these things. And so it's crazy. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. I'm going to go check that out. I was thinking about when you were talking also about imperialism um, uh, and uh wishing Comrade Fidel a happy birthday. Uh, actually, I'm just gonna read this in the chat because it's more powerful than what I could say. It's it's talking about, um, so a comrade in the chat talks about how um, Fidel sent uh, troops that was like also connected to Che, che uh, to Angola. And so there was the solidarity there of like Cuba with Africa fighting the struggle and freedom for, um, for Africa. And so really seeing our connection the connection worldwide to our people, not just here, but imperialism and how we see the struggle, whether it's in um, Valenzuela, whether it's in Cuba, whether it's in Africa, um, whether it's in Dominican Republic, like being able to see um, our struggles connected, uh, I think is really important. And that's what like that action did with Fidel, being able to send troops in uh, to Angola. And what also happened there was like the, Co collaboration and training of Africans for Africans to leave the struggle in Africa, right? So the solidarity and making sure like the correct, uh, um, making sure the support that was needed that Africans got to define that, right? They got to define the support needed for their, for their own struggle. Um, and so what that was making me think about is like, what are, you, what are ways that you think are strategies to, elevate imperialism and show like we're all connected like it's not we're not in isolation of our people like you were doing the numbers there of how many africans there are worldwide and so what are some strategies you think that can connect to um helping to connect those dots that's a good question because i i think about this a lot because you know we have we really do have like a deep uh, to me a deep issue with this here in the snakes and stuff like that where people really do feel like um like our like our situation here is isolated like uh, we have our own and i'm not saying 
we don't have our own specific history that happened in, you know, inside the snakes with a certain, you know, specific group of people. But at the same time, it's the it's the systems that that to me are that matter. And so the strategy, I, I think about it a lot. And to me, the only the, the only thing is to show that these systems that were in place here were also in place in Haiti. They're also in place in Guyana. They're also in place in um, in uh, um, in Africa, in Angola, in Mozambique. And so, like, you know, capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, these things are uh, these things are that not only do they pertain to us, they pertain to our people all over the globe. And so people don't, that's, that's part of the problem. People don't realize like what Max Stanford said, people are so, they have us focused on trying to get rights and being a national minority within America, instead of recognizing that we are a colonized nation within a nation. And so um, they don't realize that our situation is literally, is literally can be compared to places like Mozambique and other established countries because they are colonized nations and so are we. And so until we start realizing that it's the system that's got us and it's colonialization um, um, and it's capitalism and it's imperialism that are global things and they affect us here in one way and they affect our people um, around the globe in maybe a slightly different way, obviously, but at the same time, the system is the same. So, you know, people, um, Apartheid, we, we had a system of apartheid here in the same exact sense that a, there was a system of apartheid in um, in Azania. And so, you know, our civil rights movement is in the, you know, the, the Jim Crow era. That's uh, that's apartheid. And so if it was happening here and it was happening there, OK, well, that's that's kind of, you know, that should be that should start sparking people's mind. People, you know, the people in the Congo, when they were getting colonized by the Belgians and fucking King Leopold's punk ass they were doing some of the same things to them that they had done to us in slavery, cutting people's hands off, having big ass thick chains on people's necks and stuff like that, having quotas. And if you didn't beat them, you were getting whipped or beaten or murdered and um, exposed and um, your genitals cut off and stuff like they were doing the same exact things to them that they've done to us. And so that's Belgium in Congo. That's not even the, that's not even the British folks that was, you know, like, you know, doing stuff to us. And so if the systems are the same, and we are the same, well, then we have to start making those connections and we have to start viewing ourselves as a colonized people instead of a national minority. We're not a caste. We're not a caste inside of a, inside of a, of a democratic nation. We're not, um, a net, we're not a minority. We are a colonized, here in the snakes, we are a colonized nation of 40 million African people. And we deserve to have self-determination and our sovereignty. And until we start realizing that we have that, and we start thinking sovereign, like sovereign people, it's like, you know, we'll be spinning wheels until we get that. But I, so I, I don't know if that answered your question about the strategy, but I think we have to, we have to uplift and always amplify the fact that it's the systems that are the same along with our people. And so if, if the systems are the same, then we have to strategically, the most uh, logical thing to be, to do would be to link up so that we can overwhelm the system. Thanks, Rashad. I don't have anything to add there. I just see like a connection that you're making about the system and what um, happened in Mozambique, right? It was the system that created um, that traitor mentality. It was the system that created that colonization mentality. And so being able to do what you said allows us to, you know, be unified. Yeah, most definitely. And so, um, so um, about the Mozambique Revolution, uh, I just I'll get in. I want to get into a little bit about the Mozambique Revolution. Um, so you know they they gained their independence in 1975, and it's um, well actually okay. This is a good question. I well, well okay. I'll mention this real quick because you know so Mos um, so Samora Michelle was actually murdered. Um, I think this what this documentary was done in '76. So I think ten years after this documentary. He was um, people, you know, people say he got into a car crash, uh, a plane crash, but he was murdered, I think, on September 19th, um, October 19th, uh, 1986. And so. Um, yeah, you know, and it's. it. Uh, you could say anything about you want about for Lima, but the fact that they, you know, 
they went from Eduardo Malande and then he was murdered during the revolution against Portuguese. And then they came to Samora Michelle um, and he led them through the revolution and then he was murdered. And so, you know, imperialism is always, they don't ever forget. And so even if we gain our independence and stuff like that, they're always looking for little cracks and little folds to fit themselves in. And they'll, when they see a shot, like, oh, fuck, he's in the air. We can, it's easy to catch him in the air. We can get him in the air. We can, we can do something to that plane and stuff like that. We might not be able to get him when he has all of his, the structures around him and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I just think that's interesting that the, that the enemy, they never forget and they always come back. But there was a question in the chat from comrade Kwame and he asked, does our fight for self-determination have a decidedly different, have decidedly different conditions because we aren't on our ancestral land. So we have to fight to get free and get back. Is he saying like, get back to, to the continent? You get that question? Oh, did you hear the question? Yes, I was able to get the question. So I think that's a good question because it's a lot, you know, a lot of people, you know, I do think our situation is different over here because we're not, oh, back to the continent. No, you're good. You're good. You're good, comrade. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, um, I think it is, our situation is slightly different and our fight is maybe a little bit more complicated because of the fact that we're not on our ancestral land. Most of, I don't even know where I'm from. And that's like a big thing for me. Like, I don't know where my people are from. I know, most likely I know we're from West Africa, but it, I mean, people did come from Mozambique. People did come from Southern Africa and stuff like that. They did steal people from those places. And so the fact that we're not on our ancestral land, most of us don't know where the fuck we come from anyway. We know the region or maybe something like that. I think it does create a little bit different circumstances. And it's something that, um, that I know disconnects people from the continent and makes it harder for them to really recognize that there is a connection there. And so um, what do you think we can do? What do you think, Monique, uh, Monica, that we can do to, to sort of bridge that gap? And, and even though, in, yeah, go ahead. No, this is a really good question because I remember I, tell, I probably told this story before, but I remember at eight years old, not wanting to go by African-American because I knew I was an American. It was very clear to me that I wasn't. Uh, the way that I was treated was very treated very differently from people who didn't look like people who didn't, weren't African, right? And, but they had, but I didn't think I was African at all because what I saw what was what was represented, what was deliberately shown to us about Africa was the deep poverty and suffering that's happening, but not the conditions that created it. So I've always I had that black identity and really appreciate the transition to like identify as African. So I think that's a process. And so until we're able to see we're connected to Africa and that's our land, and those stolen resources have built um, all of the global economy, right? Like literally um, France, the enslavement of um, Haitians, right? Built France. Like I didn't know um, that chocolate came from Africa until maybe like six years ago, maybe five years ago. Like I did, I had no idea. So people don't know the richness of resources of our people that are there in Africa, like the stolen resources to build um, economies that don't help us, economies that oppress us, economies that we build. And so I feel like once we're able to really understand um, the fight, the fight and struggle of our people, the resistance of our people, that that is our homeland, um, like we're, we're not able to have that self-determination because People are so focused on that individual gain in this society. So it's like, I want to picket fence. I want a house. I want to be middle class. I don't want to be in poverty. And you're only in poverty because you choose to be in poverty, right? Like all those things we're conditioned in. So first, before we even get to that, like self-determination, it's like really understanding who we are and then being able to see like we're connected to Africa. So I feel so connected. To Africa. Um, 
And I know that I used to be in a space where I used to be like, well, I'm, I don't, I don't know where my people are from. So like, what part would I go to? And now I don't like think like that. Cause it's like, it don't matter. Like I'm African. It doesn't matter what that looks like. And I think, um, it's a process and the process looks different for everyone. And what's really great is when you're having organizations that are African led that are for our people, it really helps to have those hard conversations and be vulnerable where you're able to talk about um, like for the longest time, I didn't like the color of my skin because that's what I was taught. Right. And like, I unlearned that and that like, I, un- I am glad I unlearned that before I became 18. Right. And I'm even teaching my son now about like his hair texture because his hair texture is very different than it used to be. And like I'm wanting him to love his whole self. Right. And really understand his whole self and not be looking at other people. And so it's just it's a process and being part of, you know, African organizations, being under uh, like your own healing journey, your own um, the identity journey really helps. Um, to see that. So I think it's a process um, and learning about Africa, like being able just to like learn about um, how our people just fought and struggled for us so deeply every moment, like, and the, the love that our people had from us, like they didn't abandon us. You know, our people fought for us. So those are some of the thoughts that I'm thinking about. And I, it's a process. My cat's trying to get inside. And, and, and Kwame, comrade Kwame says, I think learning our true history is a major step because we are subconsciously told and reinforced to be inferior. Yep, I agree. And that we have always been that way when it's just so it's when it's uh, untrue. Yeah, we're definitely not. We're, we're taught about our oppression and our suffering, but we're not taught about our our um, resistance. Right. Um, even a lot of museums that are focused on African American are really still, it's really highly like 90% of the time, even when I've gone to those museums is all about our suffering. It's not about the resistance um, of our people, or if it is bringing up the resistance of our people, it's the ones that we've already learned and heard about. Right. Um, uh, But not like, the hundreds that are out there, right? Thousands that are out there. Yeah. And so that history, you know, that history, learning our true history and stuff like that. And like you said, it's a process, but yeah, that history, learning that is like super impactful because Comrade Kwame saying again, you know, that Dr. John Henry Clark was a big, big influence for him. And that's true for me too. I know for a lot of our people going back to, I mean, I'd say, I mean, almost over like 60, 70 years, people were learning from Dr. John Henry Clark and people were reading, uh, you know, his works and listening to his lectures and stuff like that. And, you know, they had them on tapes. Now we get them on, you know, now we get to see them on YouTube and stuff like that, which is just amazing. I love that, that, that it was able to train, uh, to transition from, you know, from, from being live to, you know, being taped and people were able to listen to them tapes and learn from them. And then when tapes weren't there no more and the, you know, and stuff like that. And then new CDs. And then, you know, now we got the internet and we got his stuff, you know, a bunch of his lectures right here that we can watch. And so yeah, Dr. John Henry Clark is big, was big for me. I would say John G. Jackson, who was also, who was like a, a teacher of Dr. John Henry Clark is big for me. Uh, we, we talk about in our party, I think a good amount um, in our meetings in the Southwest chapter, uh, we talk about, uh, well, I've talked about Marimba Ani, uh, Mama Marimba Ani, who uh, wrote Yurugu, she was big for me as well. Um, and so, yeah, that history, learning our history is uh, Chancellor Williams, you know, learning our history is super, super big because that way, you know, you get the, like you're saying, we we have a culture of resistance and, you know, they the state has done a real good job in, in trying to disconnect us from that culture of resistance and trying to like, you know, um, uh, essentially like uh, put a veil over our eyes and blind ourselves to the, to our own history and stuff like that. But I think it was Kwame Ture, who's, I, who was another person who's, you know, a uh, big influence on me, uh, but he has a lecture. I think he says, you know, um, once something is in your mind, once something's in a people's brain and it's a part of us, we don't ever forget that shit. And so they can try as much as they fucking want 
to like disconnect it, disconnect us from our, our radical history, our culture of resistance, but that shit is inside of us. And so all we got to do is tap into it. Um, all we have to do is tap into it and, you know, and keep resisting and stuff like that. Keep questioning things, keep searching for the truth, because that's, that's the things that are going to, you know, uh, help us actually uh, see that our people, that we're one people, help us see our true history and understand that, you know, our people didn't, it wasn't our people who sold us. Uh, it wasn't our people who, who are responsible for the slave trade. You know what I mean? Like, you know, uh, we fought back that whole time. It was some privileged groups of African people who were, um, who were being manipulated by the Europeans who, who participated in that shit. The rest of the motherfuckers was fleeing just like us. And some of our family got caught. God damn. Some of our family got caught. Some of our family didn't. Some of our friends got caught and some of them didn't. And so, um, you know, we have to, we have to continuously, uh, fight and, um, connect the dots and make sure that we're not forgetting that we are one people. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Sorry. Cause there's dogs out here walking. And, yeah. <laughs> Do you have any closing thoughts to, um, the film that you would like to uplift? I really, oh yeah, because I don't know if we talked about, I'm, we'll close soon, but I don't know if we really, that, that, that quote that he had, that mercy is a revolutionary value, that is something that like, is like, a, I think that's something that we really have to like, take, take heed of and stuff like that, because bro, it's not, to me, it's not like a, it's not just some flippant thing that can be said like that. No, mercy is important. And being able to forgive people being able to recognize um, the faults in th in people and realize that people can actually change. That's something, especially our people. If we're gonna do it for anybody, let us do it for our own people. We don't, I'm not saying we gotta do it for the white folks, for the Europeans, I'm not saying we have to. I think it might be, you know, a part of us to do so. But at the same time, if we're not gonna do it for them, let us do it for our own people. Let us have mercy for our own people and understand that we have been up against a fucking beast. It's not like a game. It's not like something, some little ass thing that we're dealing with. These people are trying to stay in power for thousands of years. And so like we're fighting against something so powerful, so strong. And to like expect all of our people to not be manipulated by that, we're not respecting our enemy. We're not giving them the credit that, we're, that, that is due to them because they are strong. They're powerful. They have the means to do these things. They've been doing it for hundreds of years at this point in time. They know what they're fucking doing. We don't. We don't. And so a lot of our people don't know what the fuck we're doing. We don't know exactly how we're being betrayed. A lot of people, that's the part of the whole woke thing. People really think to this day that they're woke and are still sleep, are still being manipulated and stuff like that. So like it's, we are up against something crazy. And so if we're not gonna have mercy for anyone else, let us have it for our own people who we know are dealing with the same fucking beast that we are. That's the same evil, uh, sadistic, um, highly intelligent and highly sophisticated web of fucking oppression. We know what we're dealing with. And so if we're not gonna have mercy for anybody else, if we're not gonna have that for anybody else, let us please have it for our own people. I really like that Rashad about your saying about mercy for our own people. And, and when I'm thinking about our, these systems, it's like knowing who your enemy is, right? Our people are not the enemy because they are so manipulated by these systems and it was intentional and you don't know what you don't know. And so, and when you, you talked about this earlier, when you have consciousness, you can't turn it off. When you're learning about your people, when you're learning about the struggle, when you're learning about collectivism, you can't turn that off. Like you can't go back to sleep on it. You, you have to move forward. You, it, your, your mind won't let you not move forward. And so like knowing that our people are not our enemy, who our enemy is, why they're our enemy. And also in the comments, um, it there's a comment talking about no African nation can defeat imperialism alone. Um, and how why, uh, Kwame um, Nkrumah talked about a calling for a continental unity, right? The unification of Africa all together. Right. It, it, it has to be all of us together. And that's what like um, um, AAPRP is. Right. It's the 
one unification, united unification of uh, a socialist Africa, right? And so we, we're gonna have to fight imperialism together. Um, and what that means is the concept that was bought to us by um, President Michelle around the um, notion of mercy, because there's been harm done Right. There's um, and what does it look like to be in a space of having mercy? And why, like you said, I really love the way that you put it, if we're going to have mercy for anyone, having mercy on our people, because our our people are hurting. They're hurting deeply, no matter where they are. Um, They're hurting and you don't know what you don't know. And how do we share what we know, how do we learn more? Like I'm learning in this discussion, even in the chat that's happening that I'm, it pops up every now and then because my internet's not that good, <laughs> but I'm learning, um, I'm learning so much. And like that mercy is like connected to grace, the grace of, of the grace of um, like being in love and accountability and what you're going to do now to move forward, right? So it's not like washing the hands, clean slate, we're done. It's like, and now you have an action and a commitment as a collective responsibility. And so, yeah, I really, uh, I'm sitting with it still. I'm sitting with it. I'm processing it. And I think it's important. Yeah. And in the chat, you know, us, uh, who's sitting in the chat? Uh, let me look. I'm sorry. Uh, it was Comrade Kwame again, you know, he's talking about uh, we should only forgive and have mercy after restitution and retribution. And, I'll, you know, I, to me, I think that's an important thing. There's a collective group of mothers in Chicago, and I'm so sad that I can't remember what their organization name is. But it's mothers who have been affected by, you know, violence, um, um, you know, from their uh, not who've been affected by violence against their kids and stuff like that, whose kids have been murdered and who uh, other mothers who. Um, you know, just, you know, want to be involved with that cause. I can't remember the organization's name, but they have this, um, they have this like sort of idea that they, that they talk about, about deep, deep accountability or deep responsibility. And so that's something that not only African people, even if you don't know, we have to, we have to develop that in our own people. And if they, if they fall short, the only way to get that back, the only way to, to, to do transformative justice, to have mercy is if they are able to 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 do what these people were able to do and so and, you know and other people might be able to do which is you know have that deep responsibility and accountability to tell this truth to tell their story to 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 put their face out there and and fucking say they're sorry say what they did name names um dates and stuff like that that's the only way it's going to work and that's so yeah i agree on that we can't have mercy for people who aren't sorry who are hiding who are ducking who are um who who haven't taken responsibility or her just trying or only trying to blame the enemy because we know that you know obviously the enemy we know how powerful they mean i know you know i know I, the enemy is powerful at the same ex but at the same exact time you know who your people are and you can choose you could you can you can choose to fight with the right and so since you didn't we have to do these things we have to have you um uh publicly renounce what you did and say what you did and name names. And so until that, until stuff like that happens, yeah, we, we can't have mercy for you and stuff like that. But at the same time, uh, we can, we can, we can, um, we can bring that about within our people, having, having them understand that, that concept of deep responsibility and deep accountability to our people and stuff like that. And that's, you know, um, that's a whole part of that transformative justice and the mercy is the, you know, the deep accountability and the deep, uh, responsibility. But yeah, if, um, if you, uh, <laughs> uh, people also are saying, you know, to come back to, uh, that we should come back to Africa and, you know, start building. And while I do, I do agree with that and stuff like that, but per we actually talked about this. I know with one of my comrades in the party and stuff like that, he was asking like, do you ever see yourself organizing on the continent? And I'm like, you know, I would love to go back. Obviously, I would love to go back and stuff like that. But at the same time, I do feel like if let's say all of us thought like that and we I mean, it, it would it would help. And, you know, if all of us thought like that, and we all went back, you know, there's a mass migration back to our fucking homelands and shit like that. 
I would love that. But at the same time, there is work to do here. And, um, and um, so, yeah, anybody who can go back and wants to go back, I do advise you to go back. There ain't, I'm poor shit. <laughs> I'm poor as hell. And I got a big ass family here who needs help and shit. So yeah, there's no way I'd be able to go out there. I wish I could, but yeah, I'll do all, you know, anyone who can go back, I think should go back and fight. And anyone who can't, you stay here and fight for your homeland because, you know, you still know that that's your home. You're still connected to there. You still got family there. You still got people there. you got cousins mm-hmm. right now in Africa and shit like that. So, you know, um, you can be here and fight as well. You can be here and fight just as well, just as hard and shit like that. And um, so, yeah. Yeah, we need both happening. Right. So um, how we're folks who go back, how they're organizing on the continent with the people in the struggle. And then those of us that are here, how we have a huge responsibility because we're in the belly of beasts of like where uh, imperialism was birth, right? And so we have uh, to like destroy it, right? So how both are happening simultaneously um, and wherever our people are, right? That we're doing it. So both are true and both are uh, as equally important. Yep, so, you know, it was good. It was good talking to you guys. I'm glad we got some good people in the chat. Shout out to Comrade Kwame. Shout out to uh, Mo Man, Building Africa, Red Horizon, Big Teal, uh, Emma, uh, Shabaka, Comrade Zizwe, who's also an elder in our party um, in the in the um, uh, All African People's Revolutionary Party. Shout out to you guys. And thank you guys for coming and watching this documentary with us and getting to chat with us about our people, about Africa. Um, and yeah, so I'm, yeah. In Pilo, another member of our party. Um, so yeah, it's glad to. I'm good to see. It's good to see you guys. Good to chat with you guys. And um, uh, yeah, just you know, forward to the African Revolution, and we will win. And like Samora Michelle at the end of the uh, at the end of the doc, socialism will uh, will prevail. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts, Monica? Wanting to also share, if you are African. Um, or interested in uh, the Pan-African Garden in Tiwa territory, that's so-called Albuquerque. We will be out there tomorrow at 5 p.m. Come join us. We're going to be doing some planting. We're going to be having some political education on Black August. Um, so we would love to see see you. If you're not African, bring an African with you if you come. Um, be, uh, we're, we're in community, you know, uh, building this together. And uh, you can check out the AAPRP page for more information, but I think the address is 1320 Arno Southeast. It's right there on Cesar Chavez. So yeah, stay ready for the revolution, y'all. We need every single one of us, um, if you're African, involved in an organization fighting for our people. Yeah, and also real quick, guys, uh, the, um, our comrades out in Burkina Faso, they have a, a, a Thomas Sankara Center and they're doing... Um, they're doing fundraising. She, uh, they're trying to fundraise for, you know, books for kids and stuff like that um, for the young ones that come through. Um, and they have like a whole thing called Burkina Books and it's on Instagram. They're on Facebook. Um, um, I'm pretty sure they're on Twitter, too. And so, yeah, they're definitely accepting donations right now. Free If anyone's in France, they're accepting uh, French books as well. Um, um, and so, uh, dang, I should hold on. I'm going to try to put it. Yeah, I'm going to put it in the chat. Yeah. Post yeah, I'm it, in the, put it in the chat. <laughs> oh, the Zoom chat. Zoom. I meant not Zoom. I'm so sorry. On the feed, on the live feed, you all have access to see how you can get involved and be supportive in that critical work that's happening. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, it's called Burkina Books and they're on, you know, they're on Instagram, they're on Facebook, they're on Twitter. So, yeah, they're definitely accepting donations and stuff like that right now. And they, uh, you know, they don't need a lot, but they do need a lot. And so, you know, they're out in Burkina Faso. So, you know, yeah, on the continent. Um, so, yeah, we'll, um, I'll put that in the chat real quick. And yeah, it was good chatting with you guys. And we'll see you guys for uh, Pan-African uh, Weekly Pan-African News on the 25th. Um, so, yeah, thank you guys for joining us. And we appreciate it. And I'm about to put that in the chat right now. So thank you guys. Thanks, everyone. Stay ready for the revolution. See y'all.